Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 21 of the course on multivariate data mining methods and applications. The title of this lecture is Maclock Pitts Neuron and Single Layer Perceptron. Artificial neural network provides a powerful tool for machine learning and artificial intelligence. We can use artificial neural network to model complex phenomena, uh, particularly in analyzing big data. When the data has a nonlinear structure or nonlinear hidden structure, and uh, it may not be possible for you to use uh, some simple statistical models like multiple linear regression model or log it or private models, then you can go for ANN. ANN is also used in various fields. In this lecture, I am going to discuss threshold logic unit, which is a computationally simplified unit and it is used in artificial neural network. Uh, I will also discuss the single layer perceptron and uh, briefly different types of artificial neural networks like convolution network or recurrent network etcetera. Now, first we consider Maclock Pitts neuron or threshold logic unit. It was introduced by Rosenblatt in 1958 and then in 1962. Again, the threshold logic unit has multiple inputs or multiple dendrites and single output that is single exon. So, suppose x1, x2, xr are r inputs and xi has value 0, you may write it as off or 1 which is on. So, it is just like a Bernoulli random variable. The signal at each input depends upon whether the synapsis is inhibitory or excitatory. And if synapsis is inhibitory and transmits the value 1, the neuron is prevented from firing and output is 0. And if no inhibitory synapsis is present, the inputs are summed to produce total excitation. So, u is equal to summation over j x j and notice that x j's are taking value 0 or 1. So, u gives you the number of x j's which are equal to 1. Now, suppose theta is some threshold value, then if u is greater than or equal to theta, then you get the output 1 and then we say that the neuron has fired. So, if u is greater than or equal to this threshold value, then the neuron fires. On the other hand, if u is less than theta, then the output is y equal to 0 or you say that neuron does not fire. So, you can write y as y equal to i u minus theta greater than or equal to 0. 
this i is an indicator function. We define this indicator function as i u minus theta greater than or equal to 0 equal to 1 if u minus theta is greater than or equal to 0 or u is greater than or equal to theta and it takes value 0 otherwise that is when u is less than theta. So, this is the graphical representation of Maclock's Spitz neuron with R binary inputs. The R binary inputs are x1, x2, xr and then it has one binary output and the threshold value theta. So, this is your input layer. and you are getting inputs x1, x2, so on, xr and then we do computation. We simply take the sum of all xj's that is x1 plus x2 plus so on plus xr and then theta is the threshold value here after taking the summation you obtain u and then we make use of this threshold value and ultimately you get this output y and uh, uh, the value of y is either 0 or 1. It takes value 1 when the neuron fires that is when u is greater than or equal to the threshold value and it takes value 0 if the neuron does not fire that is u is less than theta less than the threshold value. So, here your input space is r dimensional unit hypercube with 2 to the power r vertices and each vertex is associated with a specific y value 0 or 1. Say for example, if r is equal to 2, then what are the possible values? x 1 equal to 1, x 2 equal to 1. So, this is x 1 equal to 1, x 2 equal to 1 and then you have x 1 equal to 1, x 2 equal to 0 this vertex x 1 equal to 0 x 2 equal to 0 here and then corresponding to x 1 equal to 0 x 2 equal to 1 you have this vertex. So, you have r equal to 2. So, ultimately you how many vertices you have 2 to the power 2 equal to 4 and uh, you get hyper cube which is here a square a square with naturally four vertices and each vertex is associated with a specific y value 0 or 1. Say suppose you take theta equal to 1. Now, what are the possible values of x 1 plus x 2? it takes value 0 or 1 or 2. It takes value 0 on this vertex when both x 1 and x 2 are equal to 0. It takes value 1 on this vertex or this vertex when uh, one of the two x 1 or x 2 is equal to 1. Either x 1 is 1, x 2 is 0 or x 1 is 0, x 2 equal to 1 and it takes value 2 when both x 1 and x 2 are equal to 1 
and then you have taken theta equal to 1. So, if x 1 plus x 2 greater than or equal to 1, then you say that the neuron fires all y equal to 1 and if it is less than 1, then y equal to 0. So, these three vertices are corresponding to y equal to 1 and this vertex is corresponding to y equal to 0. And then this line x 1 plus x 2 equal to 1, this divides the hyperplane into two parts or the hypercube into two parts. Say one side corresponding to y equal to 1 and other side corresponding to y equal to 0. So, each vertex is associated with a specific y value 0 or 1 like in this example and given theta the Maclock Pitts neuron divides the hypercube into two half spaces according to the hyperplane summation over j x j equal to theta. Then vertices with y equal to 1 lie on one side of the hyperplane. This is the hyperplane dividing the hypercube into two parts and vertices with y equal to 0 lie on the other side of the hyperplane. Now, these are the diagrams of Maclock Pitts neuron for the end and all logical functions with r binary inputs and thresholds theta equal to r and theta equal to 1 respectively. Say so, suppose you take theta equal to r, then when y takes value 1, y takes value 1 when x 1 plus x 2 plus 1 plus x r is greater than or equal to r or when x 1 equal to 1 and x 2 equal to 1 and x 3 equal to 1 and so on x r equal to 1. So, if x 1 equal to 1 and x 2 equal to 1 and so on and x r equal to 1, then the neuron fires or y equal to 1. So, this is the graph corresponding to the pits, uh, the Maclock Pitts neuron for the AND function and logical function. Now, this is the graph corresponding to r logical function. Here the threshold value is 1. So, you take the threshold value as 1. Then y equal to 1 if x 1 equal to 1 or x 2 equal to 1 or x 3 equal to 1 and so on or x r equal to 1. So, this is the graphical representation for the all logical function. Now, a function y belonging to 0 1 is perceptron computable if for a given theta for the given threshold value theta there exists a hyperplane dividing the input space into two half spaces say r 1 and r naught where r 1 is corresponding to points having y equal to 1 and r naught to points having y equal to 0. Now, if the points in R naught and R 1 can be separated without error, 
by a hyperplane as we have done in the previous example. The two sets of points are linearly separable and this binary partition of input space enables a perceptron to, to predict class membership whether y belongs to one class or y belongs to the other class. Say you have input variables and then you can partition the input variables space into two classes. Now, here is an example. A loan officer of a bank is asked to put an applicant for a loan based on a five point scale answer to a set of ten questions. Now, the points scored on each question are totaled and compared with some given threshold. The loan officer's decision on the loan could be predicted based on whether the total score surpasses the threshold or not. So, in this problem R is equal to 10. Then your input variables are scores of questions. You have x1, x2, so on, x10. These are the input variables. And you simply add all these input variables. And if the sum is greater than or equal to this threshold value, then the applicant may be given a loan otherwise not. Now, limitations of Maclock Pitts neurons. We cannot use Maclock Pitts neuron if inputs are non Boolean means Boolean means uh, it takes value 0 or 1. Non Boolean say for example, if uh, x is some real number say how much deposit the customer has in his bank account or how much loan he has already taken previously. So, these variables are non Boolean. Then all inputs may not be equally important. In Maclock Pitts neuron, you are taking u equal to x1 plus x2 plus so on plus xr and then you are comparing it with some threshold value theta. So, in fact, while calculating this u, you have assigned equal importance to all these variables x1, x2, so on xr. All the input variables are given same weight, but all the input variables may not be equally important. So, in that case you may prefer to assign different weights to different input variables. Now, we consider a learning rule of neuron excitation. When an exon of cell A is near enough to excite cell B and repeatedly takes part in firing it, then some kind of growth process takes place in one or both cells. So, that A's efficiency as one of the cells firing B is increased. So, it is uh, just like when uh, the input variable x, whenever it takes value 1 that is it fires, then you have input variable x say and it takes value 1 that is it is firing, then 
it excites the cell B. Since cell B has output say Y. So, it increases the chances of Y also firing, Y also taking value 1. Then some growth process takes place in one or both cells. So, uh, if you are assigning the same weights to all the input variables, then uh, you are not taking account such kind of growth process. Then a strength of a synaptic connection between two neurons depend upon their associated firing history. So, how much strong the synaptic connection is? So, it also depends upon their associated firing history. It, it, just like in the multiple linear regression model or simple linear regression model, if increasing the value of x increases the value of y also, then it means you should increase the value of beta 1, the weightage given to x. But if increasing the value of x decreases the value of y, then you should decrease the value of beta 1. So, ultimately beta 1 here denotes the strength of the connection between x and y. So, more often two neurons fire together, the stronger the connection. Neural inhibitory rule. If A persistently sends signal to B, but B does not fire, thus it reduces the chance that future signal from A will excite B or fire. So, if you are getting, if uh, B is uh, consistently getting signal from A, but uh, B does not fire, then what does it mean? Firing of A reduces the chance that B fire even in future also. A signal from A will excite B, chances of this are small. Then inhibitory rule ensures that system of synaptic connections throughout the cerebral cortex would not grow without limit as soon as one such connection is activated. So, if one of the connection like B is activated, then uh, Obviously, the inhibitory rule ensures that uh, the system of synaptic connections would not grow without limit. Now, we consider single layer perceptron. A perceptron is a Maclock Pitts neuron, but now input x i come with a connection weight. So, you have assigned a connection weights also. Again x 1, x 2, x i are these are input variables and these variables can be either binary or real value. So, we are considering both the possibilities either these input variables take binary values or these input variables are real valued. Then, uh, Suppose beta 1, beta 2, beta r, these are the connection weights and then the magnitude of beta i shows strength of the ith connection. It is just like the regression coefficient. So, you define u equal to summation j equal to 1 to r beta j x j. So, suppose uh, some weight beta j is positive and large then uh, what it implies? It implies that whenever x j fires, so suppose x j is binary. So, whenever x j fires means x j takes value 1, it increases the value of u and it increases the chances of y firing also. 
So, u is the weighted sum of input values and y takes value 1 if u is greater than or equal to theta and 0 otherwise. Again you write y as this indicators function i u minus theta greater than or equal to 0. Alternatively, suppose we write beta naught equal to minus theta and x naught equal to 1. So, in that case you can write beta 1 x 1 beta 1 x 1 plus beta 2 x 2 so on plus beta r x r greater than or equal to theta can be written as minus theta plus beta 1 x 1 plus 1 plus beta r x r greater than or equal to 0 and then you are writing minus theta equal to beta naught and x naught is equal to 1. So, you can take beta naught x naught here plus beta 1 x 1 plus 1 plus beta r x r greater than or equal to 0. So, u is equal to summation j equal to 0 to r beta j x j. Then beta naught equal to minus theta is called the bias element theta is the threshold and minus theta is the bias element. And in this case y equal to 1 if u is greater than or equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. So, these are the two equivalent representations of Rosenblatt's single layer perceptron with r inputs connection with beta j's and then you have binary output y. So, this is the perceptron with threshold theta, you have inputs x 1, x 2, x r corresponding weights beta 1, beta 2, beta r, then you take sum means summation beta j x j and then this is the threshold value you get u here and then we compare u with theta and we get some output y. Then the perceptron with bias element beta naught equal to minus theta and x naught equal to 1 is represented like this. Say we take x naught equal to 1 beta naught here, then you have x 1 corresponding with beta 1, so on x r corresponding with beta r. Then we take u equal to summation j equal to 0 to r beta j x j and then you get y. If u is greater than or equal to 0, then y equal to 1 otherwise 0. Again the function y belonging to 0 1 is perceptron computable. If for given theta there exists a hyperplane that divides input space into two half spaces r 1 and r naught where R1 corresponds to y equal to 1, the neuron fires and R0 corresponds to y equal to 0, that is neuron does not fire. Now, if R1 can be separated without errors from R0 by a hyperplane, then we say that two sets of points are linearly separable. Now, in brief we discuss different types of artificial neural networks. Some of these networks uh, I will discuss in detail in subsequent lectures. Now, the first one is feed forward neural network. In feed forward neural network, the input enters through the input layer and then it exists through the output layer. Then in between it has a forward propagated wave only and it does not have back propagation. Now, what do we mean by forward propagation and backward propagation? Forward propagation this is the process of computing the output 
for a given input and then you have no backward computation. Then back propagation, back propagation is the process of updating the weights. You have the input data and then you have the actual outputs also and then on the basis of fitted model we have predicted output also. Then what we do? We calculate the error between the actual output and the predicted output. Then further we update the weights by minimizing the error using some tool or some algorithm. So, we consider the error between actual output and the predicted output and then based on the error we update the weights. So, this is the process of back propagation. Convolution net neural network. Uh, here actually I am giving you just a very brief idea of convolution neural network. The convolution neural network has one or more than one convol convolution layers. Now, what is this convolution layers? or how we perform the convolution operation that I will discuss when we discuss the convolution network in detail. But uh, normally at the convolution layer you have tensor as your input and we perform convolution operation on the tensor or on the input and then we pass the result to the next layer. Now, your next layer may or may not be the convolution layer. So, it depends upon the structure of your network. Then it is applied uh, in speech and image processing or computer vision also. Then recurrent network, quite often it is used for time series data also or when you get uh, the data continuously and the observations are you say in some sequence. And recurrent network saves the output of a layer and feeds it back to the input to improve or to better predict the outcome of the layer. So, initially what we do? We get some output of a layer and then we save the output and uh, then we feed it back to the input for the better prediction purpose to the output of the layer. Then in uh, the current neural network, we compute the output of the first layer just using or just like a feed forward neural network because before the first layer you have just uh, the input layer and then after the first layer each unit remembers information from the previous step or it acts as a memory cell in performing computations. Again uh, in uh, one of the subsequent lectures, I will discuss this 
the excellent neural network, when to use the excellent neural network, under what conditions, or its various applications in detail. Radial basis function neural network. Radial basis neural network has three layers architecture. It has input layer which receives input data and then it has one hidden layer. The input data is passed into the hidden layer with a non-linear activation function. So, in the hidden layer you are using a non-linear activation function and uh, at this stage you are performing the computations and then ultimately you get an output layer and at the output layer you can perform prediction task such as classification or regression. Suppose your problem is a classification problem, then uh, your predictor is a particular class and if it is a regression problem or you are doing predictive modeling, then your output is it may be some continuous variable. Now, radial basis functions or RBF or kernel, these functions consider the distance of a point to the center. So, what we do? We take the distance of a point from the center and then we define a function, kernel function or radial basis function. And uh, this radial basis function can be used for data representing some underlying trend or function. So, suppose your data has some kind of underlying trend. Then uh, to model that trend or to evaluate that trend, you can make use of this radial basis function and it is quite similar to k nearest neighbor models, but it has slightly different uh, implementation. Then uh, in general your weight is equal to RBF distance. So, you define radial basic function for the distance, the distance of a point from the center. The greater the distance of a neuron from the point being evaluated, the less weight influence it has. So, usually this RBF of distance is inversely proportional to the distance. As the distance increases, this weight decreases. Now, suppose x belongs to R, this is the input vector and phi is some activation function or the radial basis function which maps from R to R and capital K is the number of neurons in the hidden layer and mu i is some central value of neuron i. Then alpha i is the weight of neuron i and A i is the weight of neuron i. Then rho of norm of x minus mu i is the radial basis function. Here the norm of x minus mu i 
gives you the distance between this input vector and the central value of nu long i mu i. Then your model is phi x equal to summation i equal to 1 to k a i rho norm of x minus mu i. Uh, say for example, if you are using the Gaussian RBF, then the form of the Gaussian RBF is rho norm x minus mu i equal to exponential minus gamma i norm x minus mu i square, which is equal to x minus mu i transpose x minus mu i. Then you have the input layer and uh, parameters mu i's and these are the radial basis functions or here you are doing the computation. This is actually the hidden layer and you are applying the radial basis function here. And then you have weights ai's associated with different arcs and finally, you get the output here. Uh, then RBFN has an easy design and provides a good generalization. It has just one hidden layer. So, it is designed it quite simple and it is faster to train and it has a straightforward interpretation of the functioning of each node in the hidden layer. So, its interpretation is also simple because its architecture is quite simple. Now, we consider modular neural network. Uh, suppose your uh, network is uh, quite big, then definitely it involves a large number of parameters or a large number of weights, a large number of hidden layers and uh, a large number of nodes in each hidden layer. So, it becomes uh, computationally quite complicated to train the network. Now, some of the weights may not be so important, but you have to keep those weights in your network. Uh, when you are training your network. The objective of modular neural network is to break down a large and complex Q computational process into smaller components. Then we distribute computations across multiple modules or processing units. Uh, just uh, a simple example, uh, suppose on the basis of activities of a person or of a small child, you want to guess whether the child is happy or angry. Now, for that purpose, you may have different input variables, how the child is uh, speaking or whether he is crying or not crying or uh, the tone of his voice, if he is speaking then the tone of his voice etcetera. So, some of the input variables are connected with his voice. What kind of words he is using when speaking etcetera. And then you are also looking at his face. How is his face looking? Whether he appears to be angry from his face or 
whether he is uh, very actively moving his hands or his legs or not. Now, one of the possibility in artificial neural network, if suppose you are using artificial neural network to predict whether the child is happy or not, then one of the possibility is that you take all these input variables at a time and then you combine these input variables and uh, then you get the output. You predict whether the child is happy or not happy. Now, you have two kinds of input variables. One is based on your visual perception means how the child is looking, how he is appearing. And uh, the second set of input variables is uh, based on his voice, the words he is using etcetera. Now, to analyze the visual kinds of things, your mind uses one part and to analyze his uh, voice part, your mind uses another part. So, it analyzes the variables associated with his voice using some other part and then it combines the output of two, you can say the output of two networks and ultimately it gives you the final output. So, this is the basic idea behind modular neural network. It contains a collection of different neural networks working independently with no interaction towards obtaining the output. So, you have different neural networks performing different activities and uh, while doing it, there is no interaction between those networks then each of the different neural network performs a different subtask by obtaining new unique inputs compared to other networks. So, ultimately each neural network is performing a subtask and it uses a subset of inputs. So, this is the structure of modular neural network. So, this sub network it has these input variables or input layer, then it performs the computations and ultimately you get the output for this neural network. Then you have another neural network which has this input layer, hidden layers and then you get the outputs. And uh, then uh, these outputs are the inputs for this layer and then ultimately you get this final output. So, this is how the modular neural network works. It divides the entire task into different parts and then each sub network this performs a particular task and then you combine all these tasks and get the final output. So, in this lecture we have discussed threshold logic unit which is a simplified model of a computational unit which has been used in artificial neural network and then uh, in brief we have discussed uh, several other neural networks like uh, recurrent neural network, convolution neural network or the modular neural network. Some of these networks we will uh, consider in detail in uh, our subsequent lectures. Uh, so, here I am going to stop. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Chitwan Lalji, a PhD student of Health Economics under the supervision of Dr. Debian Pakrashi uh, from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kanpur. In one of my essays, I'm interested in understanding the relationship between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. Health indicators, both subjective and objective health indicators like mental health, self-assessed health, various measures of blood pressure and various measures of cholesterol. Uh, measures of blood pressure like systolic and diastolic BP, you have your incidence of high BP, MAP and incidence of high MAP. And as far as cholesterol is concerned, I have tried to concentrate more on total cholesterol, good cholesterol and incidence of high cholesterol. Now before I go on to what have been my major contributions and various policy implications, I would like to briefly tell you about the policy initiatives of WHO and various countries. The WHO, that is the World Health Organization, it started with a campaign of five a day. That is, you should have five portions of fruits and vegetables per day. That would be approximately, you could say, 400 grams of fruits and vegetables. Now, a portion, before we go further, I'll just tell you what exactly is a portion. One portion is equivalent to a medium-sized apple or one small glass of fruit juice, which is approximately 150 milliliters and uh, maybe three teaspoons of vegetables. So, uh, the WHO went with a five-a-day campaign, which was further taken up by various countries. Countries like UK, Netherlands, Germany, Norway, they adopted the five-a-day policy, while some went for expansionary dietary policies, like France, Australia, Canada, Denmark. So, for example, Australia, it went for go for two plus five policy, in which it said that you should consume five por two portions of fruits and five portions of vegetables per day. And USA went for a policy of fruits and vegetables, more matters. That is, you must consume more and more fruits and vegetables. Now, irrespective of these expansionary dietary policies and dietary propagations, it has been found that only 28% of women and 25% of men they actually meet the recommended dietary norms of five a, po five a day portion. So the major contribution of my work is firstly to find an association between fruits and vegetables, whether there exists a relationship between fruits and vegetables and health indicators. And if there exist, whether if due to heterogeneity in the data, so I will be doing it according to age, by gender and by uh, your weight. So, apart from that, I will go for policy recommendations in which I, will, I am basically studying uh, how much fruits and vegetables matter, apart from that, which type matters more. So, for that, I have taken data from the Health Survey of England. Health Survey of England is an annual survey which takes uh, data, which con conducts information regularly on demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. You have your lifestyle behaviors like an individual smokes or doesn't smoke, alcohol consumption, you have your sedentary and physical activities and you have various health uh, indicators also which have been collected. Uh, so uh, before I go on to what exactly is my research, I would like to concentrate more on fruits and vegetables like what kind of questions were asked in the survey. Questions like what kind of fresh fruit do you eat? Did you eat any dried fruit yesterday? Don't count dried fruits in cereals, cakes. Apart from that, for vegetables, they asked how many tablespoons of vegetables did you eat yesterday? So approximately after this whole survey was conducted, data was converted into portions of fruits. And uh, like for example, three, por three tablespoons of vegetables is equal into one portion. So data was converted and provided to the users, that is us from the UK Data Health Survey. So the major con contributions of my paper is that I found a strong negative association between uh, intake of fruits and self-assessed health, then various measures of uh, blood pressure like mean arterial pressure, high mean arterial pressure, high blood pressure, systolic and diastolic BP and your total cholesterol. Apart from that, I have found a strong positive association between consumption of vegetables and good cholesterol. So it is recommended in a way that if you want to control your blood pressure, you must consume more and more fruits. And as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact your good cholesterol. Apart from that, I went in for a falsification test. A falsification test is basically conducted to know whether the model that you have adopted and the conclusions that you are drawing are not spurious. So if uh, a falsification test is done to know, in a way it is tested by seeing 
an indicator, a health indicator which is not being impacted by your consumption of fruits and vegetables. And then see, we see whether there is significant result or not. If there is no significant result, that means your model is good and your results are non-spurious. So what we did is for falsification test, we took ear complaints and infectious diseases. Now ear complaints like if you are deaf since birth or you have some kind of imbalance, body imbalance, that is not being impacted by your post consumption of fruits and vegetables. And we did find insignificant results. Apart from that, infectious diseases like HIV, A, HIV AIDS, etc., we found similar insignificant results, indicating that our, uh, that our results are not spurious, non spurious. Apart from that, we went, uh, since there was a, a lot of heterogeneity in the data, like uh, by gender, by age and by weight. We, can, we did the regression analysis. We found results which stated that as far as uh, fruits are concerned, it impacts a male's health more than a female's health. So it is basically said a, a man should consume more fruits to impact his health, whereas as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact a women's health more. But this has been only seen as far as cholesterol is concerned, the various measures of cholesterol like total cholesterol, good cholesterol and your incidence of getting high cholesterol. Now after this, we went in for a policy implication and in the policy implication, we found, we tried to find two policy implications, what matters and exactly how much portion matters. So as far as how much portion matters, we have found that on an average, five or more portions of fruits impact your overall health, that is your self-assessed health, your MAP, your incidence of high MAP and incidence of high BP. But if you want to have a good mental health, so you can optimize your mental health by consuming three or four portions of fruits as well. And similarly, has, uh, as far as self-assessed health and total cholesterol is concerned, an individual must consume four to five portions to optimally have the impact of consumption of fruits. Apart from that, vegetables have had a very little impact on your health. It only impacts your incidence of getting high MAP and high BP. And uh, you, it's seen that only it impacts when you consume five or more portions of fruits. So an optimum consumption of five or more portions of fruits and vegetables are recommended. But fruits have a more impact on your overall health, on various measures like self-assessed health, mental health, your various measures of blood pressure and various cholesterol levels. Another thing that we find is which type of fruit matters. It has been seen that all size fruits, they impact your self-assessed health, your systolic and diastolic blood pressure, your mean arterial pressure, your high BP and incidence of getting high MAP and high cholesterol. But we find that uh, as far as frozen fruits or canned fruits are concerned, they have a, they help in regulating your incidence of getting high MAP or high BP, but it has a trade-off that means there is something negative happening, it reduces the good cholesterol in your body. Apart from this, it, if, you ha if you have an incidence of getting high cholesterol, it is recommended that you must consume fruit juices because it has a si impact in reducing your probability of getting high cholesterol. And uh, dried fruits, they impact your self-assessed health. As far as vegetables are concerned, very little impact has been seen. It has only been seen in case of uh, uh, portion of salads and its association with self-assessed health. Another thing that they have seen is vegetables in composite, they have an association with good cholesterol. So overall, my research basically says that there is an association between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. And um, it is highly recommended that an individual in order to be healthy must consume five or more portions of fruits and five or more portions of vegetables per day. But fruits have a more impact on your overall health. Apart from that, all size fruits, they have a better impact on your overall health, your mental health, various measures of blood pressure and cholesterol. So thank you.